So this is a Boston song written uh, in, in, in Austin in February of 1974 while Jeff was singing with Zamir. We stayed up very late a couple of nights and this was the uh, result of that late night.
greetings to you, uh, Jeff and, and Danny. Uh, even though it's virtually, it's good to see you. Uh, we've just watched this wonderful concert that we did back in 2007, so many years ago, when we honored cantor Jeff Klepper for his many contributions to Jewish music and to spirituality. And the two of you co-wrote Shalom Rav, I think it was in 1973, and it became one of the most well-known prayer songs, almost achieving that pinnacle of success being called trad or traditional. So the first question is, uh, how did the two of you meet each other? How did you come to be a musical duo? Well, I think we met at a, um, a conference of religious school teachers in, I don't remember where it was, maybe Hartford. Um, and we were both teaching religious school in different large synagogues in New England. And then we ended up spending several sessions at um, Nifty, the Nifty uh, New England region's uh, winter retreats. You know, if you get into Connecticut or New Hampshire in the middle of winter, uh, there's a lot of time just to hang around because there's no place to go. And uh, we started writing songs. This is 1971. And uh, so we were just a year or two after uh, Debbie Friedman had started writing and Mike Isaacson was writing some popular music for, for the Camp and Nifty setting. And uh, so we started trying, trying our hand at it. Dan and I were both college students in 1971. It was the end of 71, which means we're coming to our 50th anniversary <laughs> of friendship. Mazel tov. <laughs> and singing together. And um, after that fateful meeting that that Dan mentioned, which I think was Hartford. Um, Dan and I traveled in the same universe in reform Jewish uh, circles, educators, youth people. Although he was going to college at Trinity, I was going to college at Clark, but people would come up to us and ask if, if we knew the other, thinking that we were kindred spirits and um what well, we hadn't met as yet but uh before our first time together on faculty at a nifty winter institute i had a shabbat dinner at dan's home and uh i'm i'm i'm, I'm like a native a i'm a native worcesterite and uh, jeff was at clark and uh, taught in the synagogue where my mother also taught so uh my mother adopted jeff <laughs> i was treated like the the fourth son of the family it was like a tv show <laughs> and, uh... so uh you are the lennon and mccartney of, of jewish music uh, what was it like to uh, co-compose what was the process like first always came text and um, because we were both religious school teachers and having a lot of challenges teaching the the, the, the bad music curriculum we were trying to find ways to teach uh, prayer texts in particular uh, to our young people in ways that would be catchy for them. So like the first song we ever wrote was Modeani Lefanecha Melechai Vikayam, which allowed us to open every teaching session with Modeani. So there were a series of these very short, upbeat, always upbeat um, songs for, uh, for our religious school students who were really young kids. And uh, that's that, those are the first things that we wrote. And I, if we if we look at our, our uh, repertoire, um, you know, all the things before se late '73 were pretty high power, those major keys, um, aimed at a particular audience. And uh, and then so text always came first. Jeff would usually do, noodle around on the guitar with chords, and um, and whistle or hum a tune. And uh, we'd go back and forth and back and forth. Well, Dan had a much more rigorous music education than I had. I was a folk musician. I played guitar from the age of eight, but emulating um, Pete Seeger and Tom Paxton and some of the folk singers of that time, Peter, Paul, and Mary, the music on the one hand was simple, on the other hand, deceptively simple. There was a lot going on, especially in the vocal harmonies. 
And um, while when Danny and I sang, it might have been a, a third-rate imitation of Simon and Garfunkel. Um, when you when Dan talked about the music being very upbeat and catchy, that actually is true in a very real sense because um, we came from the generation that grew literally grew up with the Beatles. But the point being that the, the, the tenor of the time, sorry for that pun, the zeitgeist in that rock and roll era meant that the, the music and the tonality was swirling around and especially the rhythm and that rhythm of the Beatles and others came through in our songs. Yeah. No, certainly that was a period where you mentioned the rhythm, but the lyrics and the harmonies were just so much more sophisticated than things we had heard before. Uh, so let's focus now on Shalom Rob itself. It was 1973, It was I think. late 73. Great. So tell us about the genesis of that song, please. Well, I, I, had, um, I had just graduated uh, Trinity College and moved to Boston, and uh, I was living in Waltham, and Jeff was in Alston, I think. And um, we were we were hanging out with one another a lot, um, and I was the uh, cantorial soloist at uh, Beth Elohim in uh, Wellesley oh, yeah. at the time, and the Yom and and this is during the Yom Kippur War, and um, I was sort of shaken to my core musically. What do you do when the world is is radically changing around you? What do you sing, and the, the, the melodies and arrangements you have? feel dated. They don't feel like they're speaking to the moment. Um, and um, this is a year after um, Ben Steinberg had written his Shalom Rav, which is what I used on the on, on the board that year, and uh, and I was using on most Shabbatot. But as soon as we came into contact with the, uh, the, the kids at the camp conclaves, uh, that melody, the melody was beautiful, but it, the, the rhythm of it and the feel of it didn't work. And I des we desperately wanted a peace song uh, in the post Yom Kippur days. I, on the other hand, the, the model for me was was uh, Ark Einstein's uh, Aniva Ata, mm -hmm. which was, had been written a year or two earlier and had sort of was the closing anthem, if you will, for for the, uh, when you put your arms around everyone else and you wanted a way to close the service or close the, the friendship circle of the event. And, and just to um, clarify, that's the song, Aniva Atan Shaneta Olam, you and I have the power to change the world. Tikkun Olam song. Very optimistic, but it wasn't liturgical. And I was looking for something that could work in the tefillah, the liturgy setting, and in the popular sing-along. It was spiritual, if not liturgical. Yeah. And don't forget, this is a time when we were making, we were considering anything written in Israel uh, to be spiritual. I mean, you, you'll remember the the uh, contemporary services where they would close with "At Sharam Al you know, anything from anything in Hebrew and anything from the '67 War. That's why Ose Shalom became so popular so quickly. So we 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 were looking for that sort of anthemy feel. I brought to this conversation, a relic of that time. This was the Reform Movement prayer book. There were two volumes, but perhaps it looks larger on the screen, but this is a very tiny book. It's about six or seven inches uh, high. And I distinctly remember Dan and I, we had a ritual of writing songs as Dan alluded to a minute ago, in which I had a cassette tape recorder on the table, and I would turn it on and off. In other words, whenever somebody had an idea and started riffing, I would hit record and record the ideas so that we wouldn't lose them. We were not like uh, Rogers and Hammerstein or even Lieber and Stoller. We didn't have no, you know, notation paper to write down the thoughts. Dan could do that, I could not at the time. And um, I distinctly remember, so we had the tape recorder, perhaps a bottle of wine on the table as well. And um, Dan would hold the prayer book and he would flip through it, literally 
flip through it reading the pages. And the thing you have to know about the Union Prayer Book, the, the Hebrew prayers were not translated verbatim the way they are today. You had more of these, um, I'm forgetting the, <laughs> the word, you know, universalistic, um, you know, important thoughts and truths uh, rendered in the English. So Dan would have to translate the Hebrew as he went along, and he would look for verses that jumped out at him, and then he would say, let's try this. I think the important thing, I want to say two things about Shalom Rav. Um, number one is that it's not enough just to find an interesting text or a text that you want to sing. The text itself has to have two important things. It has to have meaning, important meaning. And number two, it has to have a certain kind of syntax, a poetic style to it that enables you to, to sing it in short phrases and repeating phrases. Now, Karlbach had done that, Shlomo Karlbach, who was one of our um, inspir inspirational figures, one of, one of several, did that a lot. The other thing I want to point out about the melody of Shalom Rav, and then we can dig into those if you want to, I could point to half a dozen or more melodies of the time to which Shalom Rav it's pretty close in feeling. Joni Mitchell, James Taylor, the, the, the Beatles. The, we were not inventing anything new, but I think we were capturing some of the sounds that were in the air. I'm not saying we stole music for Shalom Rav, but you can certainly see the inspiration. But structurally, um, we were very conscious that the core message of the song, the one you the want chorus. To, the chorus that you want people to sing over and over, and maybe even understand the translation of, yeah, um, had to be very strong and sing the hook, as we say in popular music. So, tell us about the reception of the song. Uh, how did it come to be such a iconic song? How did it spread? Well, its first performance. We probably tried it out in a December 73 uh, Nefty conclave, but uh, it, it, it was still morphing, it was still developing. And when we listened to the early tapes of the, of the song, it, it, it's, it's, it's different in 1973 from the way we know it in the year 2020. Um, Shalom Rahab al Yisrael Ametha Sasi. But our first real public um, sort of codification. Brandeis. He took place in Brandeis in February 74. And I'll always remember that because that's the evening that, that uh, my, my wife, Elise Frischman, came to hear Je her friend Jeff uh, sing at Brandeis and, and met me. So um, I know exactly when the song was first performed and when I met my wife. Um, but that's the lovely romantic part of it. But by, by um, and then it was also recorded in 1974. Um, our friend Louis Delvin produced a series of uh, record albums called Songs Nifty Sings. And uh, it was a way of disseminating new melodies throughout the reform movement camping system and youth system. By the time Shalom Rav was recorded for those, for that series of LP records, Dan and I had already written, as he said, um, a version of Modani, uh, a, a, a sort of a campy, catchy version of Ashrei Yoshevei Techa. Tov 
Tova Hodot Lashem, Lo Alecha, if I'm not mistaken, V'yashvu Ish Tachat Gafno. The reason I mention that is, I think that Dan and I felt a certain confidence. We were still young, perhaps young and rebellious in a certain way, but confident in our ability to, to create something new that would be catchy enough for kids to sing. And that's an enormous power. It's a great thrill. There is no thrill like hearing hundreds, if not thousands of people singing your song. Uh, it's one of the memories I will carry with me for all my days. Um, the point being that I think in Shalom Rav and, and some of our other pieces, and I've never had this thought before, but I think there is a certain confidence of, of voice that we put into the song. We really did put, not that we were thinking about that at the time, but there's a certain passion that one can see in some of the, the great folk songs and, and contemporary songs of the 60s. And we were emulating, we were in our, our 20s, our young 20s. Um, but I think that really does show in the song that, that uh, we were confident in what we were doing. The availability of media to distribute is absolutely crucial here. Because by the by the summer of, of 1974, over a thousand record albums had been distributed to nine different summer camps and loads of nifty regions. And the song leaders there, we, we used to listen to records to get to figure what we wanted to sing in the dining room with the kids. We listened to the uh, Hasidic Song Festival records and and the, the Nifty Songs Nifty Sings records to find repertoire that would. So it would work for me with the group. And so it was it got not disseminated in every camp, but it got widely disseminated very quickly. We have to state the overstate the obvious. We're talking about the generation before the internet. We're talking about several generations before the internet. We become very complacent now and we're used to uh, thinking of a song and going to the computer or the phone, tapping in the title, and you can see hundreds of versions of that song. But these nifty record albums, the songs Nifty Sings, may have only sold a few hundred. But who bought those few hundred records? The song leaders, the rabbis, maybe not the cantors. That is a topic that we might want another to get into the reception or non-reception from cantors, but you had the song leaders at all of these camps, maybe a dozen regional camps. So the song was able to travel because song leaders and rabbis were the gatekeepers of the music in the camps and, and congregations. Are there some performances that uh, stand out in your memory? I mean, you mentioned hearing hundreds or maybe thousands of people. Or hundreds of thousands. Washington, D.C. was hundreds oh. of thousands. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I, I'll think of three, um, three or four specific things. Uh, one, I was ordained uh, as a rabbi in 1979, and there was still a real controversy. The cantors really hated our stuff. We were very threatened by it. But the... Um, at, at, at ordination, we were allowed to allow to pick a piece of music to be played on the organ at Temple Emanuel um, while you march down the aisle. And uh, so, I, I first one I remember is is, um, is is my ordination that year. Um, then then singing it at um, the 1987 um, mobilization for Soviet Jewry Solidarity Sunday. Uh, with a quarter of a million people in Washington, and we were the chosen musical performers that day. Um, there's a whole other story behind that, but um, we got to sing that uh, on the stage um, at, at that rally. And uh, to, to see thousands of people singing it who were not from the reform movement was very, very moving for me. Um, the, third, the third thing I remember is uh, you know, we're, we're both organizational guys, and I, I worked for the Union for Reform Judaism for over 40 years. 
um, at the close of every convention or at the close of every Friday night song session with 5,000 people gathered at a convention center, um, it became traditional for many years for, for Jeff and I to be called up and we closed whoever was leading the session invited us up to close the evening with Shalom Rabba it became an anthem of sort of the movement and that uh, I find very meaningful to me. Jeff, I don't know which other well, ones you were You hit on some good ones. Um, I was not the first cantor to play guitar in services, maybe one of one of the first, one of the first dozen or so, but I was the first person to play a guitar at Temple Emmanuel in New York City when we sang the choral arrangement of, of Shalom Rav. I, I think the thing that occurs to me as opposed to one single performance, we could see Dan and I through the 80s, especially 80s and 90s, that people took that song and embraced it and made it their own. Um, what Dan doesn't know, because I usually handle the business aspects of, of our group called Kolba Seder, that I would get at, during the 80s and 90s, once a month, at least once a month, I would get a letter or email from a congregation that wanted to include the song Shalom Rav on their temple. They didn't have websites, but the temple would make a CD. <clears throat> and before CDs was record albums, and, and now it's they want to put things on the website and Spotify and so forth. But we, all over the country and then all over the world, in little tiny ways, the song began to make inroads in many, many different communities, especially Israel as well. Uh, not to mention, of course, the uh, wonderful concert in 2007, which is one of the most memorable. Uh, uh, Josh, Josh I, I, I love that day. I love the setting. I love the arrangements. I love hearing other people's covers, their, their arrangements of, of, of our material. Um, but it was, uh, it was, to me, it felt like a canonization of the melody because it was our melody in a very tight four-part arrangement, and um, and it didn't lose it didn't lose its power, it didn't lose its spirituality, and in fact elevated it. Um, and I love the Sanders Theater; it's a very exciting place to sing. When you when you create a song, you you basically have to put what's in your heart and soul into the song. And then, you know, it's just like, like a child growing up and going into the world. You say, you know, fly, be free. And the song goes out and you don't have any control over it at that True. point. You can try, but um, the, the song really doesn't belong to us anymore. It, it like belongs what's, to what's, the like what's the correct tempo for Shalom Rav? Yeah. The, the way to do it is the way to... I'm saying the, the way to sing it is the way that you're singing it at that particular time. Well, um, just to round up, any final comments that you'd like to make or, or words of encouragement <laughs> to our viewers in this crazy time that we're living in? Well, I desperately miss singing. I, 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 I miss singing with others. I miss singing with Jeff. I miss singing in choirs. Um, I don't know how to replace it. And I'm listening to a lot more music and thinking a lot about more about music than, than I have in years. But the performative end or the, the group uh, interaction and giving yourself over to the conductor, giving yourself over to the group, um, me having to listen very carefully to where Jeff is going in the arrangement, um, that human interaction I, 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 I crave and I miss. And I don't know how to replace it in these times. The thing that I would like to say I remember back in the, the 1990s, and Dan and I used to get phone calls from, from rabbis and from camp directors saying that they couldn't find song leaders to staff their camps and their religious schools because the generation of Debbie Friedman and myself and, and, and others um, we were now in the profession. We 
were not itinerant anymore, going around to different camps. And um, there was a lot of worry that without the song leaders adding the passion and the energy to, to the, the camp experience, you would not have the same power that, that affected Dan and I when we were at camp. So one of the things that came out of it was a workshop called Havana Shira, which was founded by Debbie, the late Debbie Friedman, myself, and, and camp director Jerry Kay in, um, in Wisconsin. And we started with a room full of 50 people, and then it grew to several hundred people coming for the summer and learning how to song lead. My point being, this is the early 90s when we began that campaign. Today, you have hundreds, and I mean that literally, hundreds of young people. It's an army of young Jewish kids, and some of them are not kids anymore, with guitars, and they really are doing the work that Dan and I started to do, but in a much more powerful way, literally circling the, the globe. Jewish historians of 100 years from now will look back at this time as being a very important moment in Jewish culture. Of course, as Dan says, if we don't begin singing together yeah. again soon, um, Lord knows what will happen. But Something may replace it. We don't know what. But um, it's, it's, it's my, my traditional bent is the human voice singing with another human voice is the most powerful spiritual uh, trans, transla translator available. How true. Well, Danny and Jeff, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, we learned so much about your song and its depth and its meaning. And uh, wish you all the best. So we, uh, well, Josh, we want to thank you for the inspiration that you have given us over the years. And it's, it's very, very important. Well, thank you, Jeff. Thank you. Yes.